La ilaha Brothers and sisters in Islam, ladies and gentlemen, I believe it to be a pleasure, a refresher, and an honor for us to have somebody of the caliber of Ahmad Didat in our midst. He's just come back from a tour of the Arab states on these very topics. And he's had a series of topics and lectures delivered during this week already at various venues. We are glad to have him in Hanover Park tonight. We welcome all of you to this evening's lecture. And in case some of you may leave early, I would like to remind you that we would like to see you and your friends and your neighbors at the City Hall tomorrow evening. The bill or the poster is in front of the table crucifixion with an X, or is it in fact fiction? Please turn up, and I can assure you, from what I've heard, you've got to be there seated before 7.30. If not, you'll be compelled to stand outside. The topic tonight is something that everybody will be able to follow and find interesting. You don't have to be a scholar of the Bible. You don't have to be a scholar or a student of Islam to be able to understand the topic. Open any newspaper and you'll see Arab and Israeli conflict. The topic tonight, Arabs, Israel and the Arabs. Is it conflict or conciliation? I give to you Brother Ahmad Didat. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. قال رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي صدق الله صدق الله المرن العظيم Mr Chairman brothers and sisters the topic of this evening Arabs and Israel conflict or conciliation is not a subject which we have conjured up from thin air. We have had a gruesome reminder of this subject in this evening's paper, the Argus, Friday 13th. Friday the 13th. You remember, jokingly I was telling you, for the Westerner, 13 is an unlucky number, and Friday the 13th is double bad luck. So you have Friday the 13th this evening, and you see here in the Argus, this evening's paper, Israeli hostage blitz. It says here, commandos rescue 30 passengers, kill three Arab guerrillas in 25-second dawn raid. And it carries on. It's an eternal reminder. It's a gruesome reminder about the problem in the Middle East between the Arabs and the Jews. Now, this title also is not a title which I have thought of, Arabs and Israel, Conflict or Conciliation. When the Israelis, when they attacked Lebanon, in Beirut they attacked the Muslims, I think it was 1982, and they were trying to destroy every Palestinian in Beirut. You remember the occasion, every day there was news. American cluster bombs were being used to wipe out the Palestinians once and for all, solve the problem. That's what the Jews were thinking, that by destroying these Palestinians in Beirut, they would solve the problem of the Middle East. Around that time, I get a telephone call in my office from a Professor Lawson of the Natal University. Professor of law, his name was Lawson. So he's asking, he says, look, the Israeli Council General is invited by the Jewish students to lecture to Natal University on the problem of the Middle East. But I feel, he said, I feel that it is unfair that we only listen to one side of the story. If you would be prepared, 
we would like you to also be represented on the platform, present the Muslim point of view. And I am always game. There's something I just can never say no. Somebody invites me, and if I'm free, I say, right. She said, how should we advertise the topic? So I suggested that we advertise the pros and cons of Israel, which means the for and against of Israel. Very neutral subject. The pros and cons, this man, he will say in the favor of Israel, and I might have something opposite to say. Pros and cons of Israel. Oh, this is a very beautiful topic. He says, I will inform the Jews and I will come back to you. I said, all right. A few days later, he phones me and he says, you know, the Jews are suggesting they are not satisfied with your topic, the way you present it. They want the subject to be Arabs and Israel, conflict or conciliation? Question mark. So I said, all right. You see, there is a catch. People generally don't see the catch. The Jew is very ingenious. Allah has given him a lot of intelligence. A lot more than most of us. And in the Holy Quran, I was checking up this evening. You know, Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam had two sons. Hazrat Ismail and Hazrat Ishaq. And Allah bari ta'ala is describing Hazrat Ismail as ghulaman halima. Halim means a a, a suffering and, and a humble person. And he describes Ishaq as alim, very knowledgeable. Now Allah is all wise, he's omniscient, he knows. And he's describing Ismail and his children as halim, submissive, suffering, patient, persevering. They are the children of Hazrat Ismail, Islam, the Arabs. And the children of Ishaq, the Jews, alim, knowledgeable, Allah is giving, as I was telling you the other night, everybody, Allah has given him something special. He's given something special to the Arabs, he's given something special to the Jews. So, this Ali, knowledgeable people, ingenious people, they are now tying us up before we start. Conflict or conciliation? What do you want? So, if we say conflict, you'll tell the audiences, you see, these people, Muslims are brawlers, they're looking for trouble. They want a conflict. We want peace, they want conflict. So from the word go, we are on the losing side in the minds of our listeners. If we say conciliation, then he says, you see, what are you, why are you throwing stones at us? Why don't you leave us alone? So it's heads I win, tails you lose. Either way, you are the loser. I said, all right, we'll accept it as they want it. You see, this game, the Jews played 2,000 years ago with Jesus Christ. Same, no difference. A very ingenious people, as I say. They came to Jesus again and again with problems, created problems. They created the problems. They come to Jesus and they says, Master, in the Hebrew language, they would say, Rabbi, Maulana Sahib, Sheikh, Ya Sheikh, Ya Imam. Must we pay tribute to Caesar or not? Must we pay taxes or not? What a question to ask this messenger of God. Must we pay taxes to the government or not? See, there's a catch. The catch is, if he says pay tribute, pay taxes, then they will tell the people that this man is not our Messiah, the man we are waiting for, our liberator. This is not the man. Because he's a stooge of the government. He's telling us to pay taxes. So he's in trouble. Who Jesus will be in trouble. If he says don't pay taxes, then they won't pay taxes. So if the government accosts them, he says, look, our, our Messiah says don't pay. So either way, Jesus loses. It's heads I win, tails you lose. Beautiful, beautiful strategy. Either way, Jesus would be the loser. But Jesus is also a Jew. And also Allah has given him that intelligence. So he's asking them, where is the tribute money, the tax money? So they give him a coin. So here. They say, whose inscription is this, this picture? Whose picture is this? This is Caesar's. He said, well, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. What belonged to him, give it to him. <laughs> so he got out of the difficulty. He got out of the difficulty. I'm only demonstrating how ingenious Allah has made these people. You can never win against a Jew in any type of 
written document, you, you get into it. Or in a discussion or a dialogue, it's very difficult. They come to Jesus again, according to their own records, the Christian record. Now they bring a woman, they catch her and they bring her. He says, you know, master, this woman, we caught her in the act of doing zina, adultery. What must we do to her? So if he says, stone her, they'll stone her. Well, that was a law. In the Torah, it says the adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to death. So if he says stone her, they'll go and kill her. And adultery was not a capital crime in the Roman Empire. So they'll be charged. He said, why did you kill that woman? He said, look, our Messiah said so. So he's in trouble with the government. If he says, let her go, then they say, you see, this man is not a man of God. Because of the Torah says that the adulterer and the adulterer must be stoned to death. So again, heads I win, tails you lose. Both way poor Jesus loses. So what does he do? Again, he's also a Jew. Allah has also given him that intelligence. So he says, let him who's free from sin cast the first stone. Anybody who's sinless, you haven't done any crime, you didn't do haram, zina, then you start. And then he started scribbling in the sand. The Christians don't know what he was scribbling. People were watching over his shoulder to find out what he's scribbling. Actually, he was scribbling combinations of names. Mary and Joseph. This guy who was looking over the shoulder is Joseph. And he had something to do with Mary. So he says, Mary and Joseph. It reminds him as he's me. Away he goes. Then Solomon and Bathsheba. So the guy was looking over the shoulder was Solomon, and he had something to do with Bathsheba. So away he goes. By the time he's finished scribbling these combinations, the whole lot of them were gone. <laughs> because they were all Zanis, they were all adulterers. So he solved the problem. <laughs> now what are we to do with the Jews? So ingenious, what do you want? Conflict or conciliation? I said, all right, you can have it. Let them have it as they want. If they say, you must speak first. I said, all right, I will speak first. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. You know, I said, look, if Allah has put you in the right, if you have got the right, this thing, you don't have anything to worry about. So we had a, a debate with Dr. Lottem of the Israeli embassy in Pretoria and myself. It was a fantastic meeting. It was videotaped. But you see, when we started this meeting, it started with a small hall. And there were hundreds milling outside. They want to get in, and they can't get in. So the chairman said, look, we'll have to move from here into a bigger hall. So everybody, everybody started moving to the bigger hall. And these camera people, they also had to carry the things along. And they just put it somewhere, and they started shooting. And behind us was a long curtain. And this curtain was flapping. And these things here, you know, they're so sensitive that they are effective to any type of light, light change. So the camera is also doing that. As our eye would do, these lenses are also doing the same thing. And so the film was not so grand, so we didn't promote it. But it was a fantastic meeting that we had. However, what is the case about the Jews and the Arabs? What is the problem? You see, the Arabs, when this problem started, and the problem really started around 1918. Prior to 1918, the Arabs, they didn't know that they were a nation. You see, in a primitive stage of man, the man thinks, well, he's a human being. Everybody is a human being. You come along, and there's a land next door to you. If he comes and settles down there, ahlan wa sahlan, you know, the Arab would say, family and plain, mm, this is all Allah's, the, the earth is the Lord's, and the goodness thereof, everything is Allah's, you can enjoy, come. So in 1908, the Jews established Tel Aviv, one of the most important cities in Israel today is Tel Aviv. They started building Tel Aviv in 1908. What did the Arab say? Nothing. It's our cousins, you know, they're building a city there, you know, let them carry on, mashallah. You know, they're doing a good job. Then some poor Arabs, poor among all communities, you know, they try and take a little advantage if they can steal your sheep, your goat, they'll do that. Whether he is a Hindu poor man or a Christian poor man, the poor man is always out to pinch something or the other. So if an Arab went and pinched some goats or sheep of the Jews, and the Jews had vigilantes, you know, like you see these films, Cowboys and Crooks. You know how the cowboys, you know, with the gang, they go and run down the crooks. Same type of thing the Jews were doing with the Arabs. 
They used to corner them up and give them a good bashing, you know, in gangs, vigilantes, you call them. What did the Arab say? Nothing. He said, you see, my brother, the Arab says, my brother, he went and stole my cousin's sheep and goat, so he gave him a good whacking, he deserved it. They were not thinking in terms of Arab and Jew. See, this is my brother, and that's my cousin. My brother had no right to steal my cousin's sheep. So if he did it, and if these guys catch him and give him a good whacking, he deserved it. They were not racist. They were not thinking in terms of race, Arab or Jew. No, no, no. It was one human being to another. This was the relationship. In 1918, Wiseman, Wiseman, a Jew, a very brilliant scientist, he helped the British government in some invention about gunpowder or something like that. And as a reward, the British government, they said, now we will give you Palestine as a Jewish home. This is what he wanted. He said, right, we give it to you. Palestine as a home for the Jews. Now the Arabs wake up. He said, look, man, this is our home. These guys want to take it away. So they started rumbling, grumbling, but unorganized, backward people, uneducated people. So they're making noise, <laughs> they're making some little trouble here, little trouble there, and it carried on. But the Jews were getting in more and more Jews, sophisticated people from Germany, from France, from Poland, from Russia. They have been brushing their wits against the Westerner. They come along among these simple simpletons, fools. These our brothers were like fools. You know, what the white men came here, what they found the Bushmen and the Hottentot and the Bantu, similar condition they found the Arabs there. So they started their techniques and they started getting in more and more and more. And the Arabs started making a little bigger noise and a little bigger noise until 1948. In 1948, the Jews, they started bombing the British. The King David Hotel, they bombarded and they killed so many people. Count Bernadette, they killed him. Some British soldiers, they captured them and they hanged them. This Begin fellow, Begin, he did it. So the British government offered a reward of $47,000, dead or alive, for Begin, the ex-Prime Minister of Israel. And the British threw in the towel. And these people, they had the experience. They were in the World War II, World War I. They had a million soldiers, a million Jews from all over the world, experienced people. And they knocked hells into our brethren. And they captured the land. They had certain peace apportioned to them, but they went and, you know, the Arabs started making trouble and unequipped. <laughs> the Egyptians came there and they got a good whacking, and the Jordanians came and got a good whacking, and our Jewish cousins, they did the job. They captured more than what was supposed to take. But in the previous 1400 years of Islam, or a thousand years of Islam, the Jews were living among the Muslims. In Spain, when the Muslims conquered Spain, the Jews were working side by side and they benefit from the fruits of the Muslim conquest. The golden age of the Jew was the golden age of the Muslim. The best time that they ever had was under the Muslims in Spain. And for a thousand years, the Christians have been persecuting the Jews. Every Easter, they kill the Jews. He said, these are Christ killers. They kill our God, kill them. And they kill the men, and they did what, what they liked they with the women, and they burned their homes, and they fled. One pogroms after another. This country, in Germany, in Poland, in, in uh, France, everywhere there were pogroms against the Jews. Every Easter, the Christians reminded themselves that these are the killers of our God. Kill them. And they massacred them. And they fled. And they fled to Muslim lands. And the Muslim says, Ahlan wa Sahlan. You know, you are our cousins. Father Abraham, you had two wives, Sarah and Hajra. You are the children of Sarah. We are the children of Hajra. Who oh, come, live. And they went and lived. Peace. In a thousand years, there had not been a single right against the Jews in any Muslim land. An individual Jew might have killed an individual Arab. And an Arab might have killed a Jew. But as a race, as a people, kill the Jews. Never. No riot in any Muslim land in a thousand years. Trouble only starts when now they want to capture this as their own national home. They are going to rob our brethren of their heartlands, homelands. Now in 1926, a young Jew by the name of Leopold Weiss as a reporter for a German newspaper called Frankfurter Zuiton, 
he visits Jerusalem. And he's a Jew. So the Jews were having a meeting with Weizmann from England. He is really the father of this Jewish state, Israel, Weizmann. So in the meeting, they had a plan on the big table, and they were marking out what are we going to do, and we'll take this away, and we'll take that. Among the Jews, they're planning, scheming. Ben Gurion was there. All these are young people, you know, planning, scheming. Maybe Begin was also there. So this young Jew, he had a conscience. So he says, while this discussion is carry, being carried on, he said, I'm reading from his book. He said, I had the disturbing impression that even he, who Weizmann, most of the, like most of the other Zionists, was inclined to transfer the moral responsibility for all that was happening in Palestine to the outside world. The moral, for all the trouble that was brewing, they say, you know, British is responsible, the Germans are responsible, but not themselves. They are, they are immaculate, masoom, you know, sinless people. This impelled me to break through the differential hush with which all the other people present were listening to him. They were all wise men talking, nobody did interject. And to ask, he says, and, and to ask, he asked, and what about the Arabs? So look, the way you are carving out this country, this was in 1926. You know, so look, you're going to take this like that, and you'll take that like that, and we'll take this Gaza Strip here, and we'll take this Jordan here like that. He said, look, what about the Arabs? So this our reporter says, Leopold Weiss, German, Austrian German Jew, he said, I must have committed a faux pas, a false step, something that I shouldn't have, you know, something out of, out of turn, by thus bringing a jarring note into the conversation. For Dr. Weissman turned his face slowly toward me, put down the cup he had been holding in his hand, and repeated my question. What about the Arabs? What about them? So what about them? What about the Arabs? Well, this young man <laughs> bleeds. Well, how can you hope to make Palestine your homeland in the face of the vehement opposition of the Arabs, who, after all, are in a majority in this country? They are in a majority in this country, in Palestine. So the Zionist leader shrugged his shoulders and answered dryly. He said, we expect they won't be in a majority after a few years. We expect they won't be in a majority for very long. Perhaps so, this young man says. You have been dealing with this problem for years and must know the situation better than I do. But quite apart from the political difficulties, which Arab opposition may or may not put in your way, does not the moral aspect of the question ever bother you? The moral aspect, robbing somebody else's property, somebody else's land, somebody else's home, does that not bother you? Don't you think that it is wrong on your part to displace the people who have always lived in this country? But it is our country, replied Dr. Weissman, raising his eyebrows. This is our country. We are doing no more than taking back what we have been wrongly deprived of. This is the mentality. This is our country, and we have been deprived of rightfully what belongs to us. We have been wrongfully deprived. By who and when? This is the question. When and who? You see, the Jews, 70 years after Jesus, a Roman governor by the name of Titus, he, these Jews were giving endless trouble in Palestine. So he kicked them all out. Out into the world, disperse them. Don't want a single Jew to be left there. That's 2,000 years ago. That is what happened in the year 70 after Christ. Now, on that strength that they were living there 2,000 years ago, now they are going to uproot the present people. And they say, this is our land, this is our home. So this young Jew, he cries. He bewails. He's about his own people. He said, how was it possible? I wondered. How was it possible for people endowed with so much creative intelligence as the Jews? Wallah, there's no exaggeration. This man, he's a Jew, he's praising his own people, but there's no exaggeration. He says, so much creative intelligence as the Jews. To think of the Zionist-Arab conflict in Jewish terms alone. Did they not realize that the problem of the Jews in Palestine could in the long run, be solved only through friendly cooperation with the Arabs, 
couldn't they think? Were they so hopelessly blind to the painful future which their policy must bring, to the struggles, the bitterness, and the hatred to which the Jewish island, even if temporarily successful, would forever remain exposed in the midst of a hostile Arab Sea? And how strange I thought that a nation which had suffered so many wrongs in the course of its long and sorrowful diaspora was now in single-minded pursuit of its own goal, ready to inflict a grievous wrong on another nation, and a nation too that was innocent of all that past Jewish suffering. Such a phenomena I knew was not unknown to history, but it made me nonetheless very sad to see it enacted before my eyes. This is how this Jew cried, what this was going on. Now, how is all this possible? That a people with such great intelligence, they can't see what they're doing, the injustice that they're committing, they can't see. You see, it can happen, and it has happened again and again. People can be programmed, brainwashed. We all get brainwashed. Everybody is trying to brainwash us, trying to give you their point of view. This is natural. And the Jews, they had brainwashed themselves, and they brainwashed the Christians. And the way they did it, you know, I have been more fortunate than most of you in having a first-hand experience of all these, what I'm relating to you now. You see, I have been working for the Jews. I worked for a Jewish firm, which today has more than 125 branches in South Africa, Beer Brothers. At the time when I was working for them, around the 50s, they had nine establishments, nine. Today, it's a millionaire thing, a billionaire concern. They have more than 125 branches in and around South Africa. Perhaps they have something in Cape Town as well, Beer Brothers. I work for them. So you might say, well, they must have paid you, you know, to say what I'm saying. I said, no. Allah is my witness that what I'm sharing with you is the actual factual happenings, you know, and the reasoning and the discussions, the dialogues I've had with the Jews. My boss, Mr. Bernie Beer, he's now in Israel. He's settled, settled down there now, Bernie Beer. He calls me one day, I was a dispatch clerk in this firm in West Street, Durban. So he calls me one morning, he says, did that. He says, you know, I have a Jewish couple from the Argentina and I would like to take them to the Indian area, give them some Indian meals, food, and show them the Indian area. What would you suggest? So I said, you know, there is a Goodwill Lounge in Victoria Street, Durban. But I said, the only thing Indian about that is the curry powder they put into the curry. It's all Western, it's like a Western hotel, but the curry powder makes it Indian. So I said, but look, why don't you come to my house and I will give you what we eat and I will play some Indian music in the background. Then I will take you to the mosque and that will complete your mental picture of my people, our people, the Indians. Oh, he says, that's an idea, but let me find out from my wife. You know, the, the Westerner doesn't do anything without consulting his wife. He said, look, I'll find out from my wife and I'll let you know tomorrow. Next morning, he calls me again. He says, did that. My wife is very happy about what you are suggesting. And um, he takes out three pounds, which was a stupendous amount those days. He says, look, take this. It might help you in arranging the meals. I said, no, sir, keep it. He said, no, 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 it'll help you. I said, thank you. <laughs> Made the appointment. According to the appointed time, they came. I lived in, right in the center of the town, near the Juma Masjid, within a year short of the Azan in a building called now Rajab building, just across, about 100 meters away. So they came, I welcomed them, Mr. and Mrs. Beer, Mr. and Mrs. Daniels of Lee Cole Products, you know, they have that juices they make, they had a factory in Durban, and this couple from the Argentina. I welcomed them home, we sit down to eat, you know, our, our roti, I know you know roti, I said, this is the unleavened bread of the Jews, unleavened means without yeast, I said, this is the unleavened bread of the Jews, and they enjoyed the meal, and we eat up with our hands. I says, you know, Jesus Christ also was washing his hands before eating, so we do the same. We wash our hands and we eat. And as soon as we finish the meals, we heard the azan. We can hear the azan from, where we, from our dining table. So I said, you hear, sir? That is the Muslim call to prayer. You know what he's saying? He says, no. I said, he's saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, which means Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. 
Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. He repeats it four times. Then he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, which means I bear witness that there is no other object of worship but Allah. He repeated it twice. So Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He said, I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. He is not God, he is not his son. Don't make a mistake like the others have done, we are warned. That they have made the heroes into gods, they made the prophets into gods. Don't you do that. The Muslim is warned. Muhammad is only a messenger of Allah. If you accept these two fundamentals, that there is but one God and Muhammad is his messenger. So what is the message? The Muazzin continues. He says, come to prayer. Hayya ala salat, he says, come to prayer. Hayya ala al-falah, he says, come to success. Because this is real success. That you remind yourselves about your duties and obligations towards your fellow human beings and your duties and obligations towards your creator. If you want to be successful, there is no other way. And he winds up the call, as he was doing, I was explaining, by saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, that Allah is still the greatest, Allah is still the greatest. Whether you come or you do not come, you will not lower him in his exaltation, in his majesty, in his glory. He still remains supreme. And the final words of warning he gives is, La ilaha illallah. In other words, there is no other object of worship but Allah. You can keep on worshipping your man gods, your woman gods, your money gods. But remember this, that the only one who deserves to be worshipped is him. And this is the national anthem of the Muslims wherever they live. And when the Muslim hears the call, he can hearken to the call without having to ask who is tolling the bell, whether he's an RC or a DRC. You know, RC means Roman Catholic and DRC means Dutch Reformed Church. No, you don't have to ask. You hearken to the call. Whether in India, whether in China, whether in Turkey, whether in Nigeria, wherever you hear the call, you can hearken to the call without questioning who is ringing the bell. So as soon as Azan goes over, I said, look, sir, if you like, we can go down and we can see how a Muslim pray. He said, do that, you'll be allowed? I said, of course, sir. We are very tolerant. The Arab is not that tolerant, you know. He doesn't want these people, non-Muslims, to come near the masjid. Our Nabi Kareem, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, opened the masjid of Nabawi for this Christian deputation for three days and three nights. They slept in the mosque, they discussed in the mosque, they ate in the mosque. Three days and three nights. And when Sunday came, our Nabi Kareem, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he offered the masjid, he said, you can offer your prayers here. He was that tolerant. But we have become intolerant. The best place where you can invite people is to visit your masjids. Because what impact the Salat has upon the unbeliever, the non-Muslim, you don't know. You know, when we go into the sujood, what happens to him? You don't know. There's nothing there. And you go down to the ground, down to the dust. He just can't understand. What is this? So I said, no, you're welcome, sir. So I took the half a dozen. Mr. and Mrs. Beer, Mr. and Mrs. Daniels, and the Argentinian couple. When we read the masjid, I said, please take off your shoes. I know it's an inconvenience we are causing the people, but it has to be done. So I said, do you know why you're taking off your shoes, sir? He says, no. I said, you remember when Moses was on Mount Sinai, God spoke to him and he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Of course, if they were Afrikaners, I would have said, and he say, muni nadar komni, trek your schooner, fun your footer, af, when the plek var, your obstan is heli khakrant. <laughs> and if they were Zulus, I would have tell them, say, what you got some daily lapa? Kumul is it zako, is in Yamini zako, ngogu ba in Dahu, omiguyo, omim sabadi, I tell you, there is no better way of explaining than from his own book of authority. You see, instead of telling the old-fashioned way, my father used to do, he says, you know, you people, you go to the toilet, lavatory with your shoes, same shoes you go to the church, you got no respect for the house of God, but we are a nice, clean people. Look, it's true. But if you can kill the snake without breaking the stick, why not do that? Show him. This is from your book, sir, and we are honoring those commandments. I said, before we go into prayer, we make ablution, wudu, you say abdas. I says, you know, sir, there are three good reasons why we do that. Number one, Purely from the hygienic point of view, I says no one is going to find fault with a person who washes himself five times a day. It's a good hygienic practice. And they all nod their heads. Whether Jews or Christians, they all nod their heads. It's a good hygienic practice. Number two, I say it serves certain psychological purposes, meaning it prepares the man mentally for prayer. Not, we are, not washing because you're dirty, but you're going to present yourself before the Lord. And number three, I said this is also another commandment given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses. 
in the book of Exodus, that is the second book of the Bible, it is written, and Moses and Aaron and their sons washed their hands and their feet thereat when they went into the tent of the congregation. They washed as the Lord commanded Moses. So I said, we Muslims are still fulfilling another biblical commandment. Though we haven't got the label of a Jew, nor yet that of a Christian. Yet in all humility we claim that we are more Jewish than the Jews and more Christians than the Christians. In this, that we are trying to follow in the footsteps of the prophets. It went down so beautifully, so beautifully. Went inside the masjid, time for salat, so sit down at the back, made them to sit against the wall, and he, they watched the Muslim at prayer. And I came and referred to them that everything that we did, including the sujood, was in your book, sir. It is in his book. I says, you remember, you read there, it says, and Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. I'm quoting from the Old Testament of the Christians. And Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. And I quote again, and Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and prayed to God. And again, and Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. When we come to the New Testament, we read that towards, the last, towards his last days on earth, Jesus Christ, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, wait and watch, pass up. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. Ask them, how does a man fall on his face and pray? Except the way we Muslims do. But they are ashamed to humble themselves like their God did. It's an amazing thing. Everything the Muslim does is in his book. It is there. But he, poor man, he doesn't know. He's reading, but he doesn't understand. We understand, but we don't explain. So after the Salat was over, we go back to the house, have some tea and samosas. And while we're having tea and samosas, I had an idea. I says, Mr. Beer, have you seen the Quran? He says, no. I said, would you like to have a look at it? I said, Dieter, have you got an English translation? I said, yes, sir. So I said, no, he says, I don't mind. So I had this same translation by Yusuf Ali, but it was in three volumes. You know, the paper was a bit rougher than this. So, you know, it was very bulky, so they divided it into three parts, ten separas each. So I had it in three parts. Same Quran, page for page same, but very much bigger and bulkier. So it was in three parts. So between one couple I gave one part, between the second couple I gave another part, and the last volume I gave to my boss. I said, have a look, sir. So they opened the book. It's a natural inquisitiveness. So we just opened the book and started looking. So I suggested to my boss, what I'm suggesting to you, my brothers and sisters, every night. Open the index. I said, open the index. Look up the subject, Moses. If it was a Christian, I said, open the subject, Jesus. Look, he's a Jew. I said, open the subject, Moses. So he opened Moses. Beautiful references. Then I said, look, sir, why don't you look up exactly what it has to say? You know, these are only references. So he opened somewhere. He had a look. He opened somewhere else. I'm watching them. Then he looks up to me. He says, Dad, this book is very funny. I said, what is funny about it, sir? He said, look, Dad, this book is speaking in our favor. See, but you people are all against us. So I said, it is true, sir. I said, you see, sir, the Egyptians, you know, set hard tasks for your people. They killed your sons and kept your daughters alive. In that was also a bitter sting. Why were they keeping your daughters alive? You knew why they were keeping them alive. And they said, hard task for you, Build, making bricks without straw and what and what not. They enslaved you. A free people that went there, they enslaved you. So, and you people were a people of God, believed in God. Those were all idol worshippers, the Egyptians. So God Almighty is telling us that the Egyptians have been unjust to your people. But today, sir, I said, you see, you have usurped our lands. He says, did that, how can you say that? Palestine belongs to us. <laughs> so I said, how, sir? How, sir? How does Palestine belong to you? And he knew his Bible better than many of us know our Quran. So he started quoting from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verse 8. He quoted. He says, and I will give unto thee, Allah is speaking to Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. Say, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, that's Palestine, for an everlasting possession 
and I will be the God. Means I will see to it that you are protected. God Almighty promised it to us. And this is how they have programmed the Christian world. This is the promise of God to the Jews. If they go against the Jew, they are going against God. Can't you see? Like zombies. Everybody is being led like zombies into this. So my boss, in good faith, is telling me, he said, look, Palestine belongs to us. God promised it to us. So I said, excuse me, sir. You see, the Bible gives us a test. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, we are told that, and if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? Suppose this was not given by God. Suppose God didn't utter those words about giving Palestine to Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. How are we to know whether it was such a promise was made or it wasn't made? That the word Lord had not spoken. When a prophet speaketh, says the book of Deuteronomy, in the name of the Lord, in the name of God, if the thing follow not, if that thing doesn't happen, nor come to pass, that is the thing the Lord had not spoken. Because if Allah makes a promise, his promise is true, must come to pass. If the thing didn't happen, then that is the promise that was not made by Allah. But the prophet had spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Now they believe that a prophet can speak presumptuously on his own. We believe that a prophet can't do that. He's only a mouthpiece of God. Whatever Allah Ta'ala puts into his heart and mind, only that he can utter, not what he feels like. But according to the Christian Bible and the Jewish Bible, the prophets can speak, shoot it off, you know, off the cuff, anything what they like. So I said, look, this is a test. Is it a valid test? He said, of course it's a valid test. I said, let's apply it. Let us apply to this prophecy. It's a prophecy that Ibrahim was going to get the whole of Palestine, Canaan, for an everlasting possession, him and his children. So I said, you see, sir, the day when Abraham died, it says in Genesis chapter 25, verses 9 and 10, and his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in a cave. Buried Hazrat Ibrahim in a cave. The field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Het. There was Abraham buried. There was Abraham buried and Sarah, his wife. They were buried in the same place. What land? What he had purchased with hard cash. He got nothing for nothing. He paid for it, according to the Bible, your book. So in other words, he had nothing. And we are told that he didn't have enough land to rest his foot upon. Not one square foot of land he owned. What was given to him for nothing. This is what he had to buy with his sweated labor. Then in the book of Hebrews, for the Christians now, chapter 11, verse 13, these Hebrews, you know who? Again, Paul. Well, we, we use him. This Paul says, these all died in faith. All these prophets, you know, were given promises. Allah, you know, promised them the golden carrot dangled before them. He said, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. Not having received. They didn't receive it. Allah was dangling this carrot before them, like a donkey. You know, come, come, come. And they were being led. This is what Paul is telling us. But having seen them afar off, you see that golden carrot, donkey, far, far, you keep on going for it, they received nothing. So I said, now, is it true, sir? Is it true that they didn't receive the promises? They got nothing. He got nothing. He was supposed to get the whole of Palestine for an everlasting possession. And he didn't own, not one square foot of land was given to him. Is it true? So, well, his book says so. So I said, therefore, this promise could not be of God. And the battle was over. A sincere man. Since Allah says, Min humul mu'minuna, among them there are good people, walk through humul fasikun. The majority of them are perverted transgressors. But there are good people. He said, No, I can see the point. He's my boss. But I didn't want to cut short the discussion. We wanted to pursue this further. So I said, You see, Mr. Beer, I am prepared to concede that God did make such a promise. As if Palestine belong was my father's property. I'm prepared to give it to you, in other words. So I said, now, the prophecy is, I will give unto thee, means Abraham, and to thy seed after thee. I said, who is the seed of Abraham? She said, we, the Jews. I said, no, no, no doubt. You are the seed of Abraham, but are you the only seed? 
I says, you know, in the book of Genesis, the first book of your Torah, no less than 12 places, Ishmael, that's how they say it. Ishmael is described as the son and seed of Abraham, no less than 12 times. And as for Ishmael, thy son, and as for Ishmael, thy seed, it says, 12 princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation, because he is thy seed, no less than 12 times. So, I said, you see, sir, you know, you are the seed of Abraham, and the Arabs are also the seed of Abraham. Why can't you both live in peace and harmony as brothers, instead of you lording it over them and kicking them out? He says, did that. You see, we had this country. You know, we possessed it under David and Solomon. So, they are entitled to it. She said, how did you get it, sir? You see, you went, came out of Egypt, 12 tribes, united people, under Joshua, united people. And you go into a village, that village chieftain, you know, they call them kings. You know, little fellow, with 500 people or 200 people living there in the village, is a little king. Like the Bantus they have, you know, in Kosi, in Kosi, in Kosi, everywhere, little, little in Kosi. So they had these Palestinians, these Palestinians, they also had the little, little chiefs. So they went and knocked over one king, conquered him. You, know, you are tribes, united tribes, 12 tribes against one little fellow there. And in one day they killed 30 kings. Can you imagine? They conquered 30 different countries. Can you imagine? No, what they did was one village, another village, another village, they knocked hells into them. They, they didn't know that they were a nation. This guy is thinking his village is his country. He's not thinking that, look, those guys are coming along, let us unite and defend ourselves. No, 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 this is mine, he lost it. That guy thinks this is mine and he lost it. And they lost 30 countries in one day. 30 kings, they killed the Jews. They killed 30 Jews. So I said, look, you knocked hells into the people because the people, they didn't know that they were a people. They didn't know that they were a nation. There's only one little chieftain and another little chieftain, you knock them over and you took the land by force. I said, if that entitles you to that country, because your forefathers, David and Solomon, had it, then we would be entitled to, e, uh, for, to Spain. I said, you know, my forefathers ruled Spain for 800 years. 800 years, the Muslims, and we have that go today and see the, the monuments that my forefathers built. They're still there. If we had the power, can we go and reclaim Spain? He said, look, who built the Alhambra? You built it. My forefathers built it. So we go and claim it. I said, the Dutch, can they go back to Indonesia? He said, look, our forefathers ruled it for 300 years. The Portuguese, can they come back to Mozambique? They said, look, our forefathers ruled it for 500 years. Nonsense. But he says, D, Dad, we have it. It belongs to us. You know, we got it now. I said, right, how did you get it? Might is right. Is that is your principle? That by force of arms you took it away? from the poor Arabs, if that entitles you to Palestine, then they have a right to take it back by force. Why are you complaining? If by force, if you are entitled, if justifies you taking away, possessing somebody else's property, then by force of arms they can reclaim it. What are you crying about? And the discussion went on for an hour. And this boss of mine with the other Jews, you know, they had sins. There's good-hearted people among them, Allah says. So he says, you know, did that? We didn't know that the Arabs had a case. This is his confession. We didn't know. In other words, they programmed from childhood into believing that this is ours, this is ours, emotionally, this is ours. So anybody wants to defend his property, say, no, you have no right, you are bar you're barbarians, you are thieves and brigands, you have stolen our land, so we have a right to repossess it. He says, did that, I want you to write this, and I will publish this in my Temple David magazine. It's a new synagogue of the Reformed Jews in Durban. He was the editor of this Temple David magazine. He said, look, you write what you are telling. You write, and I will publish it for you. I said, Mr. Beer, you know, I can't write. And really, you know, the writing is very difficult for me. He's talking is very easy. I like to talk. But writing, what a burden it is, I know. So I said, he said, no, no, read that. You write as you speak, and I will improve it for you. I know he meant well, but we never came to that. What do you think happened the next day, from there on, in the firm? You expect me to be fired, no? No. From the day onwards, I have become Mr. Didat. <laughs> Previously, it's Didat, Didat, 
Now he says, Mr. D. He comes in the morning and says, Good morning, Mr. D. Dad. He goes for lunch and says, Good afternoon, Mr. D. Dad. Good evening, Mr. D. Dad. D. Dad becomes Mr. D. Dad. Promotion. So in the firm, the other Jewish managers, this is the boss comes and tells them, say, you know, this guy here, dispatch clerk, dispatch clerk is a lowly job in a white firm. Say, you know, this guy here, man, he made rings around us. You see? So he must have shared it with the other Jewish managers in the firm. He says, the guy knows something, you see. So while walking through one of the departments, clothing department, and the manager of the clothing department, Mr. Baynard, another Jew, he calls me. I was wearing a white dust coat, you know, furniture trade. He says, come here, did that. I say, yes, sir. He says, you know, you made rings around Mr. Beer, I hear. But you know, you can't do that to me. He says, you know, as for Ishmael, Ishmael was a bastard. Look, this, this is how they, the, the brainwash program. As for Ishmael, Ishmael was a bastard, he says. You know, an Arab would have put a knife through him. <laughs> but we couldn't afford to do that. <laughs> so I said, Mr. Baynard, look, why don't you come home, we'll sit down and we'll talk, you know, bring your wife along and your friends will have meals together. I said, ah, you can't do to me what you did to Mr. Beer. I said, who's talking about doing anything? You come home, hmm, not interested. And every time I get an opportunity, Mr. Baynard, I said, you know my wife, I told her and she's looking forward to receiving you and your wife, come home. Every time I said, look, Mr. Baynard, come, you know, we are waiting for you. So he was persuaded, he comes. Mr. and Mrs. Baynard, Mr. and Mrs. Peel, and a Mr. Townsend, who was a backroom boy for the Full Gospel Church. Three Christians and two Jews. They come along. I, same treatment, same treatment, feed them well, take them to the masjid, bring them back. I said, now we have teas and samosas. <laughs> so they're having teas and samosas. So I said, maybe now the guy softened. You know, the tea and samosa and our meals. You know, they're very good. It might have done the job. So I'm thinking. So I said, Mr. Baynard, you remember you told me in the, in the shop that Ishmael was a bastard. He said, of course. I said, you still stand for that? He said, of course. I thought the samosas had done the job, but it hadn't. <laughs> so I said, all right, Mr. Baynard, tell me now. According to the religion of your religion, Judaism, which is better for a man to marry his own sister and beget child by her, or marry a born woman, a slave woman, a negress, and beget child by, by, by such a woman? He said, no, 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 the negress is preferable. According to the religion of Judaism, instead of having your own sister as a wife, you rather have a slave woman, a negress, a born woman, because that is what they insinuate, that Hajra, who was actually a princess of Egypt, but this rubbish, they say that she was a slave woman. It's all right, even a slave woman. Which is better as a wife, your sister or a slave woman? According to your religion. He said, no, the slave woman is preferable. I said, very good. I said, you see, according to the laws of eugenics, inbreeding, which is better for you to have your own sister as a wife or you have a slave woman, a born woman, a negress? He said, no, the negress is preferable. I said, according to your common sense, which is preferable, your own sister or this negress? He said, no, the negress is preferable. This is very good. No, the answers are right, correct. I said, you see, Mr. Baynard, when Abraham and Sarah, husband and wife, when they went to Egypt, he says, and Abimelech, Abimelech, I'm quoting from Genesis chapter 20, verse 12. You can check it up. And Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. See, he goes there, and um, this Sarah was a beautiful Jewess, Hebrew woman, beautiful thing. So this king, you know, he's enamored, he wants her. And there is what is called the prerogative of kings. You know, in the old, olden days, you see, the king has a right to take anybody's wife or mother or daughter, anything he wants, to say, I want that woman. You can't say no, otherwise it can kill you. So he's asking her that Ibrahim alayhi salam, according to the Bible, Say, this beautiful woman, what is she to you? So Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, according to the Bible, he spoke a lie. He said, she's my sister. So if she's your sister, well, send her in to the haram. So he had to send her in. 
And things went wrong that night, you know, and the fellow couldn't come right with Sarah. We don't know what happened. But uh, next morning, he's frustrated and he's calling Ibrahim, Hazrat Ibrahim I and mean, asking him, say, look, man, because of this woman, I had a sleepless night. Tell me, what is your connection with her? So he said, she's my wife. He said, why did you lie to me? Why didn't you tell me? I wouldn't have done a thing like that. And Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam says, according to Genesis chapter 20, verse 12, he said, and yet indeed, means without doubt, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. It's a different mother, but the, it's the father's seed. And she became my wife. So she is Abraham's sister, seed coming from the same father. And you said, according to Judaism, according to eugenics, according to common sense, that the negress was preferable. And you say Ishmael is a bastard because he's a child of, Ish of, of, of Hagar, through Hagar, a slave woman. So I said, if Ishmael is a bastard, then Isaac is a greater bastard according to your standards. <laughs> Look, you have a right to speak like that. We dare not speak about the prophets of God. Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam, he was a prophet of God. Hazrat Ishaq alayhi salam was a prophet of God. But now you're arguing with the sick mentality. You've got to get rid of the sickness. You've got to give it to him with a sledgehammer. When it needs a sledgehammer, nothing else will work. If you say, my man, my hero is what you say, then yours is worse. Any standard. Now, you know, when you show this, the Quran, the way it speaks about the Bani Israel. It's amazing. You see, in 1967, soon after the Six Day War, I was around one of these tours of mine, lecturing. And the Jewish society here, students of the university, they saw some of our Edwards, like you might have seen in the Agas. They stopped it. They said, one Edward, no more. Some Christians, you know, they went and complained. So they said, no, we are paying for it through our noses, but said, no. They won't have another Edward of ours. We couldn't have given to the Herald because we knew they wouldn't put it in. So we have to advertise by word of mouth what we are doing now. So please go and tell your friends and bring your Christian friends and your Muslim friends. Bring them along to tomorrow night in the city hall. Crucifixion or crucifixion. So they saw some of our Edwards in the newspapers and they phoned the organizers then he says, look, man, this Mr. Didat of yours, won't he come and speak to us in our clubhouse in Rondibosh? They had purchased a church. The Jewish boys had purchased a church and made it into a club. We would like him to come and speak to us. Actually, at the back of the mind, it was soon after the Six-Day War. They wanted to see how the Muslims cringe before them. They said, yes, yeah, well, you know, you gave knocktails into us. And cry and bewail. Oh, so we'll do fix you up in the future. We'll do this and we'll do that. They wanted to enjoy, get sadistic pleasure, you see, in working upon us. They want to know whether Mr. Didad will come and speak. Oh, they asked me. I said, yes. This is my privilege. <laughs> I can't say no. There's a sickness I have. <laughs> and according to the appointment, I will go there. And the chairman introduces me. To the audience, Mr. Didat, you know, the great man from Durban of the Islamic Propagation Center, and so on, so on, so on, so And now, to Mr. Didat. So Didat stands. And what I read to you at the beginning. You remember? It's a dua from the Holy Quran. The words of Hazrat Musa, alayhi salam. Allah bari ta'ala is recording. Qala, rabbi shirahli sadri. Now, while I'm saying that, I can see the people straining. I said, look, I thought this guy's going to speak in English, but he's talking something gibberish. <laughs> what, what is he talking? So I had to say, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen, I said, you see, I have read to you a verse from the Holy Quran. I was not trying to hypnotize you people or to mesmerize you people with incantations. And this is a prayer of the Holy Prophet Moses. Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, his prayer, this is his prayer. When he was commanded by Allah bari to go and liberate his people, in trepidation, terrified, he cried out to Allah, Qala, he said, Rabbi shirahli sadri. So, oh my Lord, expand for me my breast, means make me brave. 
وَيَسِّرْلِي أَمْرِي and make my task easy for me. وَحْلُ الْأُقْدَةَ مِنْ لِسَانِي and remove the impediment from my speech. يَفْكَهُ قَوْلِي that they may understand what I have to say. This is his prayer. So I said, I have more need to offer such a prayer than Moses because Moses only used to stutter. He used to stutter. I have more reasons to pray because I'm speaking on different level to a people. First place, English is not my mother tongue. The bulk of you, you speak English as your mother tongue, the Jews. They don't speak Hebrew here in South Africa. So English is a foreign language to me, number one. Number two, in communication, there are psychological barriers. See, we are op opposed to one another. You know from the very beginning that this guy is of the opposite camp. So your minds and heart are tightened. So now what is he going to say now? So in communication, this is another barrier, psychological barrier. So I'm trying to say something and it can have an opposite effect, an adverse impression. And it happens again and again. The guy is emotionally worked up. He's not listening. What you are saying, he's listening something else. What is in his mind, he's listening there. He's not listening to our words. So I said, there's another problem. So I pray to God Almighty that may he solve this problem, that when I speak to you, that you may be able to understand what I want to say, what I want to share. And I says, you know, this holy prophet Moses, your prophet, I didn't know that he was the prophet of the Jews. And well, I'm not lying. As a young man, if anybody asks me, who is Musa alayhi salam? He says, our Nabi. Who is Dawud alayhi salam? He says, our prophet. Who is Suleiman alayhi salam? Our prophet. Who is Isa alayhi salam? Our prophet. I didn't know that they were prophets of the Jews. They are all our prophets. We accept them. We accept them all. And this is how we said. I said, we give our children Jewish names. But we don't think that they're Jewish names. When we give them these names, we say these are the names of the righteous servants of God. We say, Musa. My eldest son is Ibrahim, same as Abraham. My youngest son is Yusuf, same as Joseph. My brother-in-law is Musa, same as Moshe. Look, we give these names to our children. Our fathers, our brothers, they have these Jewish names. But we are not thinking that they're Jewish. They are the names of the righteous servants of God. Then I says, what is the difference between us? When we take the names of these Jewish prophets, we never take the holy names without saying, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, revered Moses, may peace be upon him. Hazrat Dawood alayhi salam, revered David, may peace be upon him. Hazrat Suleiman alayhi salam, revered Solomon, may peace be upon him. This is how we talk about the prophets of the Jews. If our learned men, our Imam, if he dares to speak in the masjid and say, Musa, for Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, we'll have to kick him out. No. You're going to leave them? They call it Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, Musa. And Dawood alayhi salam, Dawood. Without saying Hazrat Musa or Hazrat Dawud they'll be kicked out. This is how the love and respect we have for the Jewish prophets of the Jews. What is the difference between us? So I said, I started reading from the Holy Quran, which I share with you now. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I'm reading from Surah Baqarah. You can find that in the Quran under B Baqarah. Or chapter 2, you can easily find that. Verse 47 to 49, I'm reading. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya Bani Israel, askuru ni'mati yallati an'amtu alaykum wa anni faddaltukum ala l'alameen. So, oh children of Israel, oh children of Israel, look at the respectful way Allah Barit Allah is addressing them. Not oh you Jews, you renegades, you vagabonds, you cutthroats, you rebellious people. Mm -hmm. Ya Bani Israel, askuru ni'mati yallati anamtu alaykum. O children of Israel, remember the special favors which I did unto you. Wa anni faddaltukum ala alameen. That, that I, my, O oh children, call to mind the special favor which I bestowed upon you. And that I preferred you to all others for my message. Allah chose them to carry out his message to the world. The guidance of God was to be shared to the whole world. Allah chose them, sent prophets after prophets to them to do that job. وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمَ اللَّهِ I think we have. Starting from chapter 2, verse 40, 46. I'm sorry. يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ اسْكُرُوا نِعْمَةِ يَلَّتِ أَنَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ So, O children of Israel, call to mind the special favors which I bestowed upon you. وَأَوْفُوا بِأَحْدِي أُوفِي بِأَحْدِكُمْ وَيَّا يَا فَرْحَبُونَ 
and fulfill your covenant with me as I fulfill my covenant with you. Wa'iyaya farhabun and fear me and me alone. Who is talking? The Holy Prophet Muhammad? Is he telling you, fear me and me alone? No. Is God Almighty talking through him? O children of Israel, call to mind the special favors which I did unto you. And fulfill your covenant with me as I fulfill my covenant with you. وَآمِنُوا بِمَا أَنزَلْتُ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَعَكُمْ And believe in what I reveal, confirming the revelation which is with you. Nothing new. The Jew says, he is made to say that God Almighty is absolutely unique. He has no partners, he has no sons. God is not seen at any time. No man can see God and live. And we give our hand of acceptance to the Jew that we believe as you believe. He says no eating of the flesh of swine. We say we won't eat it. He says no eating of blood. We say we won't touch it. He says circumcision. We say we are all circumcised. What more do you want? We say Islam is Judaism made universal. It's the same religion on a universal level. You have to be born a Jew to be a Jew. You make this a racial preserve, a racial religion. Islam is universal. We are prepared to accept anybody, everybody. Become our brothers. Whether you are a Hottentot or a Bushman or a Bantu or a colored, whatever you are, or a Chinese, whatever you are, come, become our brothers. It is not a racial religion. Judaism is a racial religion. You have to be born a Jew to be a Jew. They don't want you. وَآمِنُوا بِمَا أَنزَلْتُ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَعَكُمْ And believe in what I reveal, confirming the revelation which is already with you. The Quran is a confirmation. وَلَا تَقُولُوا أَوَّلَ كَافِرٍ بِهِ And be not the first to reject faith herein. You should be the last fellow. Because everything is confirming. Whatever you want to say, we are saying it far better than what you can say yourself. The manner in which Allah reasons and appeals to the Jews it is not to be found in their own holy scriptures. The own holy scriptures, Musa alayhi salam condemns them. All the prophets condemns them. This is you, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam says to the Jews, have been rebellious against the Lord since the day I knew you. This is what you are. You have been a rebellious people, rebelling against God. They murmured in the wilderness. Not only they, the people, but according to the scriptures, their own holy scriptures, Harun alayhi salam, a prophet, and Miriam, his sister, they both complained when he married an Ethiopian woman. Hazrat Musa, according to the Bible, besides his wife Zipporah, must be a Jew like himself, now he goes and marries an Ethiopian woman, an African woman, a Bantu woman, an Abyssinian. And they murmured against him. They complained. They said, this guy, you know, he's gone mad, this Musa, going and marrying that black ducky. What has he seen in her? Look at her. Huh? With thick lips and, you know, Cold, black, you know, well baked to color. What is this in her? So Allah bari ta'ala, because of this racism, look, this sickness is there with them from the beginning. Leave out Hajra one side. Against Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, they're complaining. Who? A Nabi of Allah, according to them. Harun alayhi salam is complaining against his own brother. And his sister Miriam is complaining. So Allah struck them both with leprosy. For the racism. Racist from the word go. And for that racism, they're getting a knock. For a thousand years, they are, racist. they are now supposed to be the fittest people to fight against racism because they know what racism means. They should be the guides of mankind to tell people, look, this is a sickness. Because of racism, Hitler destroyed six million of them. Those pogroms against the Jews, what for? Racism. They are the fittest people to fight against racism. Well qualified, best qualified people on earth are they. But no, they don't want to do the job. They become racist themselves now. What the, Jews, what the Germans did to them, now they're doing to the Palestinians. For what fault? They're asking for their homes. They so, look, this is our land. This guy says 2,000 years ago, our great-grandfathers were there. You have such love and feeling? Your great-grandfathers were 2,000 years ago. He said, yes. You never smelled this land. Now you come and grab it from our hand. But look, he said, look, I, my father died and he was buried there. I know, I buried him myself. This is my place, this is my land. Who has a greater right to that land? You, you your great-grandfathers were 2,000 years ago, not on this piece of land. Palestine was big, they could be anywhere. Now you come and rob me of my land? My father was there, my grandfather was there, and I was born there, me, myself. And you kick me out. Who has a greater right to this land? Now you want to go and have Camp David Accord. With who? With Egypt. I said, look, the house is mine, talk to me. 
He said, no, when you talk to Egypt, when you talk to Jordan, he said, who's Jordan and who's Egypt? Whose house is this? You rob me of my house. Talk to me. He said, no, you're a terrorist. I don't want to talk to you. Look, this is what, the, what they did. What, what, are they doing? what are they fighting about? This man said, look, this is my house. Give it back to me. He says, no, he says, I still remember. You know, the umbilical cord is buried there. You know, when we have this, the cord that, you know, when the child is born, he's buried there. <laughs> my, my association with this land, my father, my mother, my grandfather, my grandmother, this is my mother, I was here. No, I won't talk to you. I want to talk to Egypt. I want to talk to Jordan. I want to talk to Saudi Arabia. Who the hell is Saudi Arabia and who the hell is Egypt? This is my land. This is my home. Talk to me. Come right with me. He says, no, I won't talk to you. What sickness? Now, just think on the human level. This Allah has given them such great intelligence. But see how minds can get perverted. Program, brainwashed. The basic thing, you steal my property, talk to me. Now you want to settle with Mr. Muhammad. I said, look, what right has he to settle my affairs with you? With you? <laughs> me, come to me, ask me. Say, well, brother, forgive me. Look, I spent it already. You know, maybe one day I will try and rectify this. Talk to me. Maybe I'll give in. I'll give in. And the Arab is, Allah has made him that. Allah says so. He's Halim, Ismail, and student. Halim means submissive, suffering, they're patient. You go and talk to him. Oh, oh. So I'm telling the Jews, these young men, I says, you know, what is the real difference between us? Nothing, really nothing. We are one people, wallah, and we are one people. With the Christians, we have a lot of problems. You know, he believes in so many things, at every step now we are having a confrontation with the Christian, not with the Jew. Our only problem with the Jew is political. We are not fighting the Jew because we say he's a Jew. Kill him because he's a Jew. No, no, no. no. We say, look, you stole my land. Give me back my land. This is the fight. It's about land. It's not about religion, not about race. Kill the Jew because he's a race, different race. No, no, no. The Arab never thought like that. They said, look, this is my land. Give my land back to me. It's a political war. With the Christian is ideological, the, uh, theological. See, at every step we have a confrontation with the Christian, not with the Jew. Our only confrontation is land. So I says, you know, this problem is easy of solution. Solve it easy. And you know, you see like a madcap. And you say, look, what? The best brains in the world can't solve it, and you say easy? I said, it's easy. I say it's very easy to solve. You know, Allah says so. وَآمِنُوا بِمَا أَنزَلْتُ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا مَاكُمْ وَلَا تَكُونُوا أَوَّلَ كَافِرًا بِهِ وَلَا تَشْتَرُوا بِآيَاتِ ثَمْنًا قَلِيلًا وَيَّا فَتَّكُونُ Believe in me. Believe in me. If you... وَيَّا يَا فَرْحَبُونَ And fear me and me alone. In other words, do right. Fearing Allah means you do what Allah tells you to do. Do justice. Do justice and you have nothing to fear. Be just. So, I said, look, we are one people. In our moral law, we are one. In our concept of the divinity, we are one. In our ceremonial law, we are the closest. We are one people. Coming from Father Abraham, Ismail and Ishaq and his children. And we have now inherited the religion through Hazrat Ismail and through our Nabi Karim Sallallahu So, mentally, we are also become Semites. Though we may be in Aryans at home, my people, we are Aryans. But... Mentally, I'm a Semite. I'm like the Arab. We Muslims are all one, thinking alike. When a Muslim gets hurt in the Middle East, it hurts, hurting us all. What for? We are not Arabs. But no, it hurts us because they are my people. They are my brothers. Anything happens to a Muslim in China, it hurts us. They are my brothers. It's hurting us. In India, same thing. My brothers, it's hurting us. Racial barriers are gone. So I said, we must become one people. There's really no difference. The only difference is, is the label. You got a wrong label on. See? The label, change the label. You say you are a Jew, Jew, Jew. Yes, become Muslim, 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 because we are believing in the same things. I says, you know, the Arab world is sick. The world is sick, the Arab world. It's a sick body. Then it needs a new heart. And I say, you are that new heart. But we know from Chris Barnard's experience here in the fruit scare, that when they put a new heart into an old body, 
the body wants, is fighting against the heart because it, can, it knows the way Allah has made it, that this is the foreign thing in the body, different cellular construction. So this, the body starts fighting the heart. If the heart dies, the body dies. But the body doesn't know. It wants to kill the heart because this is a foreign element. There's a fight going on. So they drug the person, drug the person. So the fight is less. Fight, you know, allow the body to get acclimatized with that new heart. This is the system that they work on. The body of the Arab world is sick. It needs a new heart, and you are that new heart. Without them there now, you know, all these improvements that are taking place wouldn't take place at all. They're still, still smoking that hookah for the next thousand years and passing that time. It's the Jew that's waking them up. Without the Jew, we would have been sleeping still. The Arab world needs it. But the body is going to fight, rebel, because this cellular construction of the heart is different from that of the body. This is how it works. So I said, now look, your cellular construction of your heart, the heart there in the Middle East, is Jew, 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 Jew. The body cellular construction is Muslim, 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 Muslim. So you change this cellular construction to Muslim and the heart will accept. I mean, the body will accept. Simple as that. And there is no copyright on the label. Have you got a copyright? That I'm a Muslim, nobody else must use he's a Muslim because he's a Chinese. He's an Eskimo. You can't say he's a Muslim. Have you got a copyright? No. I said, we have no copyright. You can use it. So I said, look, it's so easy as that. In other words, become Muslims. We are one people. We think alike. Become Muslims. Problem is solved. So at question time, oh, the young men, Jews. You know, I enjoy talking to them. Well, I enjoy. The Jews, Jewish audiences, I enjoy most. You know, they give you a good fight. And I like a good fight. But the affair, you know, the student, he is coming out head on. But when he's defeated, he acknowledges defeat. That's the greatness. So he must acknowledge that he's beaten. So at question time, one fellow stands up. These are all mostly medical students. They said, why don't you change your label? I said, change your label to solve the problem. I said, you know, you have beaten my brother once. You've beaten them twice. You've beaten them thrice. And I said, you can beat them 30 times. But you haven't solved the problem. You'll never be able to solve the problem. Because at the moment is a problem of technology. Technologically, you are superior to my brethren. Physically, the Arab soldier is a better specimen of manhood than the average Jew. He's a better man, physically. But he's getting beaten. Because technologically, that guy's got better education. You see, the average Arab soldier may be a standard six guy. The average Jewish soldier is a matriculant. So he can follow instructions far better, more effectively than the Arab. That's why they're getting beaten. Technologically, the armaments. They can use better armaments. They got better armaments, better supplies. With the others, the Russia won't supply us, but America is giving them to the Jews. The most sophisticated weapons of attack and defense. That Russia stealing all our money, he's only giving you defensive weapons. You just sit back and get, you know, you just protect yourself, and there too you're getting a hiding. So I said, look, it's a battle of technology. And technology is not a closed shop. A time will come when the Arab also will catch up with you. And a time will come when the American will let you down. When that happens, I say, it's done for you. Before that happens, why don't you come to terms with your brother and your cousins? And the guy will let you down. During that 1967 war, 67, or the 73 war, yeah. Um, 73 war. You know, when the Arabs closed the pipelines. So there was newspaper items in America. He says, save fuel, burn Nixon. Burn Nixon. You know, the guy was president. So burn him. Save fuel. Burn that fellow. <laughs> this, uh, this American nation. Look. I says, they let you, they let the Vietnamese down. They lost 50,000 men Americans that died in a Vietnam. But eventually they threw in the towel. Look, the same fellow now, what he did now. In Beirut, he was there with his navy there, and he's shooting 35 miles away, hitting at those people in the mountains, the Muslims. This American fellow, big bully, shooting from 35 miles, his cannons. Nobody can come anywhere near to shoot at his boat. 35 miles away, he's shooting. And he's barricaded himself, militarized himself. One Muslim did the job, one man. You know that one man did the job. He chased the whole American navy, one man. Whole of the British force, whole of the French force, whole of the Italian force. One man did the job. Do you know that? Not the whole hundred million Arabs. One man did it. 
in a truck with dynamite. He went and, went and smashed into the Americans. 260, he killed one hit. And the Americans couldn't stomach that. They can hit you, yes, but they can't get hurt. They mustn't get hurt. So the Americans started crying, say, well, my son, bring them back, bring them back. Shh. So the Americans went, the Navy went, his Marines went, the French went, the British went, the Italian went. Who did it? One man did it. That spirit is required. If you are prepared to give pay for what you want, there is nothing on earth which you can't get. This is the law of Allah. You give what you are supposed to pay, pay for what you want, and you can get it. One man can chase a whole. This atom bomb is nothing. What is atom bomb against the mind of man? Where is the atom bomb? Where is the atomic plant? No, you can destroy it. They're barricading the White House now in, in Washington. Do you know that? It's this mentality they're barricading against. Says, Look, shh, these guys are too dangerous now. They know now how to hit. So I said, look, let's come to terms. You beat my brothers three times. You beat them 30 times, but you haven't solved the problem. They can afford to keep on coming back a hundred times. But if you lose once, I say it's done for you. Only once. You have to lose only once. And you are wiped out for good. Why wait for that? Why don't you come to terms? Shh. Change your label. Change your label. So this questioner says, why don't you change your label? I said, you know, I'm a young man. I like that, you see. He's, he's coming for a fight. So I said, look, I don't mind. I don't mind changing my label. But I said, when I want to change my label, you're going to put hurdles in my way. You will tell me what, what to do. Like you did to that Africana. He wanted to marry a Jewish girl, an Africana. So they said, you must learn Hebrew. So he learned Hebrew. And you must learn all the laws of the, you know, the Talmud and the Mithna and the Torah. Shh, he mastered all that. Then he says, in the Sunday Times, there was an article with this picture, he said, and at the age of 23, I was painfully circumcised <laughs> to become a Jew. Of course, they don't have to do it to us. We are already circumcised. But now, so I said, but that, that guy is still a third grade Jew. In your mind, he's still a third grade Jew. Let's say I succeed. First thing, you don't want a black man. The white man willy-nilly because his, your, sister, your daughter is running away, you want to convert him. All right. But me, you don't want really. You don't want me. But suppose I succeed in going through all the hurdles and you convert me to become a Jew. I said, what have you achieved? I said, how many are you in the world today? So somebody said, we are about 12 million then. They are about 15 million now. 12 million. I said, all right. So you become 12 million in one. You know, me also become a Jew. It's 12 million in one. But I said, you know, if you change your label, we are 700 million then. We are 1,000 million now. I said, we are 700 million. I said, we become 700 million in one. Can't you see the difference? I said, you're a businessman. You, as a businessman, you know that if you have a product for which you have a market of 12 million, 12 million pounds of five roses tea, for example. You change the label, and you get 700 million people to buy. You are a bloody fool, I said, if you don't change your label. <laughs> Ma, and there's no copyright on the label. No copyright. Put it on, man. You get 700 million customers for your product. Said, you're a fool if you don't change your label. And I tell you, the young men, I can see very sincere. Look, there's some goodness in them. With all the things that are going on, there is certain goodness in them. Which bulk of our people they lack, they haven't got it. You know that Shatila and Sabra massacre, they kill every man, woman, and child. And even the horses were killed. This is the reminiscence of what they did to the Philistines in the book of Joshua, chapter 6, verse 21. And they killed every man, woman, and child, young and old, and even asses were not spared. Donkeys, they killed even donkeys, the Jews. So now, Shabra and Shatila, they did it again. But this time they said, we didn't do it. It's the Christians who did it. I said, all right, but who was showing the flares, torches? Who was showing the torches? Not you. But we must take off our hat to the Jew. They are our cousins. With all the shortcomings, we have a lot of shortcomings too. They have something good in them, I tell you. 300 to 400,000 Jews, they gathered in Tel Aviv outside Begin's house and saying, Begin and Sharon are murderers. There's blood on your hand. Resign. Did they do that? The newspapers of the world carried said they did that. That you are murderers. They called the prime minister murderers. The blood on your hand. You, Sharon and Begin, must resign. You are murderers. There's blood on your hands. When 
not a single Muslim nation, as far as I know, nothing happened in Karachi, nothing happened in Islamabad, nothing happened in any Muslim capital of the world. Not even a word of protest. So I'm asking you. I know I'm ashamed to have this recorded, but it's a fact. I said, who is a better man, the Jew or you? He protested against his own people. So you are a murderer. There's blood on your hand, you must resign. 300,000 they gathered, and they made a big noise. The Muslim said nothing. So there is some goodness in him. And I believe that they are not meant for destruction. We haven't done our job. For a thousand years, they ran to Muslim lands, the Jews. And in a thousand years, we didn't convert a thousand Jewish families to Islam. This is it. Imagine, thousand years they came looking for shelter, for protection, for aid, and you couldn't convert a thousand Jewish families to Islam. Either there's something wrong with you, or Islam is a spent force. You tell me. Which? Thousand years you couldn't convert a thousand Jewish families to Islam. Why didn't you? Because you were satisfied, you were smug. He said, These are the Hazrat Musa alayhi salam ki come here. These are the people of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. Allah says, Ta'alaw. Call them. Ya Ahl al Kitab, O Jews and Christians, Ta'alaw. Come. No, you didn't read that. Ya Ahl al Kitab, La Taqlu fi dinikum. You didn't read that. That's the trouble. You're not doing the job. So what, Allah comes down from the heaven with a whip in his hand? No. He tells the guy, says, give it to him. Give it to him. He is taking my name and he's not doing my job. So the law comes into effect, as Allah says, وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا خَيْرَكُمْ That if you, O Muslims, if you will not carry out your duties and responsibilities, I will substitute in your place another people. ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُ وَمْثَالَكُمْ Then they won't be like you. This is his law. He's done it in the past. He's going to do it again and again. Same law must prevail always. But I say there is hope. There is hope. There are two things to do. One is offer Islam to the Jew. Talk to him. We haven't talked. So far we have been only fighting. I said talk to him intellectually. Give him an intellectual battle and deprogram the Christian. Because the Christian is programmed with the idea that Palestine belongs to the Jews. And if they go against the Jews, they're going against God. Wash that rubbish out of his head. It's rubbish. There's no such thing that Palestine belongs to the Jews. Even in the Bible, it's not there. But the Jewish program and the Christian is programmed. We have to deprogram them, reprogram them. Number one, solution to the problem. Change the names. Change them to become Muslims. Offer them. Then if they don't accept, leave it to Allah. I say, Ya Baritara, look, we want them to be our brothers, but they don't want it. Now we are fighting for Islam, not for land. At the moment, we're fighting for land. You fight for Allah and his deen, Allah is sure to help you. But now we are fighting for land, land, land. I, said, I, I don't say don't fight, fight. But look, open a second front, intellectual front. You can give battle to them intellectually. And this is Allah's promise. That it may prevail. He's given you a deen to prevail, master, and overcome every other deen. How? With a gun? No. He says, like Rahafid deen, there is no compulsion in religion. So even if you had the laser gun, disqualified. You have no right to use it, to force people to accept Islam. Then how? With the intellect, you can do the job against the Jews, against the Christians, against the communists, against every ism. Islam is destined to master them all. Try. Number two, every time we go into battle with the Jews, we are not fighting the Jews alone. We are fighting America. Do you know that? In 1973, Sadat did the job. They broke the Barlev line. They crossed that Red Sea. They broke the Barlev line. And America came in direct intervention. That Habis from there. Direct intervention with his men and materially poured in direct into the battlefield. So every time now we are fighting, the Jews remember this, that we are not fighting him, we are fighting the Americans. Now how you can fight the Americans? That weak that we are. I'll show you how. You see Harry Truman, the deceased prime minister, president of the United States. In 1948, he divulged a secret of how you can beat the American. He's telling you, but you know, we don't catch. In 1948, Israel declared her independence. Within two minutes, Truman recognized Israel, within two minutes, as if he was open, st standing with open mouth, ready like the young man, once you're getting married, 
We say in our language, nikah kabul ki. He says, you know, you accept that woman as your wife. He says, ki means yes. Like that, he's just saying, ya. You know, when you want to get married. How the guy is waiting, the young fellow? So you accept her? He says, ya. That guy was waiting with his open mouth, who? Truman. To say he accepts her as his bride, who? Israel. So a reporter subsequently, at a press conference, asking him, he said, look, man, what was all the hurry for? You know, two minutes. That means this guy just says, you know, we are declared independence, and by the time the voice reaches there, he said, we accept. What was all the hurry? You know, there are 100 million Arabs. They'll be offended with you. So Truman said, there are no Arabs in my constituency. In other words, the people who voted me into power are the Jews. There are six million Jews in America. And through the Jewish vote, without the help of the Jewish vote, you can't make a headway. While I was in these Arab countries, the Gulf states, the Daily Gulf Times dated March 14, last month, 14. There's one month and one day ago, one, one, one day short of a month, 14th, 14th of March. Here is a cartoon in this Gulf Times newspaper. It shows that a would-be president of the United States. He is marching to the presidential chair the White House, and he has to pass through a maze of the Star of David. Beautifully portrayed. But now, what do you learn from that? That means no American president can ever become the president of the United States without Jewish support. Without going through the Jewish maze of the Jewish Star of David, nobody can become a president in the United States. You need Jewish help. The end block, six million votes. Right. So now to neutralize that, we need six million Muslims there, no? And you can't get them in. They won't allow any more Pakistanis, no more Arabs, no more Bangladeshis. No more. Under some special circumstances, one here, one there, half a dozen swallows, don't make a summer. We want six million. How can you get six million in there? Impossible. But for the price of an AWAC, for the price of a fighter plane, you can win over, you can change, and you can convert six million Negroes to Islam. One fighter plane. Cheap, I tell you, it's cheap. I can't understand, why can't you think? That money, what you need for one fighter plane, that amount of money you spend in propagation, Allah will be happy with you and you can solve your problem. Because if you've got six million votes to nullify, neutralize the Jewish vote, the Americans will say, look, you Jews fight it out with the Arabs. We don't want to come in between. You know, it's now a private matter between you and them. And immediately the Jew will come down on his knees. Because without American support, it can't last for a day. That nation can't last for a day. It's living on beggary, charity of the Americans. Billions of our money is being poured in. Our money, our money lying in America. I'm talking about our Arabs, brothers. Billions are lying there, and they're lending it to the Jews at a lower rate of interest, and they're lending it back to the Western nations at a higher rate of interest. With your money, they're making money, and with your money, they're shooting you. Look, I said, put on your thinking caps, man. The guys, are, look, you had the right answer. The right answer, Truman told you. So look, no Jews in my constituency. Put them in. Put Muslims in his constituency. How? Change them. Convert them. And Allah will be happy with you. This is your awal fard. You are doing that, and you're solving your problem without shooting. So I said, open a second front. And there is hope. I feel there is hope. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 19, verses 23 to 25, and I end with that. It says, in that day, Time is coming. This is I'm reading now from the Christian Bible. In that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria. There will be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria. Assyria is of old, according to what Isaiah, if he had seen it in his vision, Assyria is Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, all that. Assyria. From Egypt unto Assyria. And the Assyrians shall come into Egypt. And the Egyptians into Assyria. And the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. Serve. Serve thinking militarily together. Mm -hmm. I opened the Jewish, the Jewish Bible, and there it says worship. Serve means serving God, not militarily in the field. Serve means they will worship together, means there'll be one faith. They will be people of one faith. Egyptians and Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt. Be one third, they'll be all united, one people and with Assyria, even in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, God Almighty will bless, saying, blessed be Egypt, my people, blessed. The first time, God Almighty is talking good things about Egypt. Otherwise, the hordens of Egypt, the idolaters of Egypt, the plagues of Egypt, every time Egypt is spoken of, is an all filthy, dirty way. 
in the Bible. Here for the first time, God Almighty says, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. That they will be, inshallah, one people under the banner of Islam. May Allah Baritala give us this, that we may take up these battles, these challenges. And in our own little way, show the people the Quran. The Jew, show him the Quran. How Allah Baritala speaks about them. Ya Bani Israel as Guru, Ni'mati Allah And you see them falling on their backs. They can't believe it that this is the book of an enemy talking so lovely to them. Can Muhammad speak like that? No. This is Allah talking. And there is a plan. In his plan, I said destruction is not the outcome. But you are going to, we are going to get this punishment. Again and again, we need a beating because we are not purified yet. Our motives are not purified yet. We need a beating. And they also need purification. Both. But once we accept Islam, as it happened in the past, in the time of our Nabi, the Aus and the Hajraj, they became one people under the banner of Islam. The same thing Allah can save us. Hold the Quran. Offer them the Quran. To the Jew. To the Christian. To the atheist, to the agnostic, offer the Quran and create a bond, the rope of Allah, that we become one people. Wa akhir dawan and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Brothers and sisters, Brother Ahmad Deed had mentioned earlier this evening that when the heart is dead, then the body is dead. There are other people who argue that when the brain is dead, then the body is dead. It's so recognized in South Africa, you're only dead once you have a certificate to say that you are dead. We say thank you very much to Brother Ahmed for what I believe to be a very interesting presentation of the subject. For those who may not have timed him, he was on his feet for one hour and 35 minutes, and I'm sure he can go on. At his age of 66, I think he can be thankful that Allah has blessed him with wonderful energy. May that energy last for many, many years, inshallah. Before we come to the question time, if there are any, let me just remind you that we have on the stage here translations of the Holy Quran. The normal selling price is 10 rands each, 15 rands for two. The special price is seven rands fifty per copy, or ten rands each, uh, or ten rands for two. Sorry, I repeat what I said the other night. Buy these Qurans. Don't buy two. Buy four. Buy six, and give it to people as a gift for their birthdays and for their weddings. Give it to the Muslims. Give it to the non-Muslims to read. When you think in terms of wedding gifts, you never know what to buy. And when you buy it, they say, I've got 10 Pyrex dishes. Give them 10 Qurans. Give them only Qurans. They can't keep all those Qurans in their home. They'll be forced to give it away. They are spreading the message. They are then serving the purpose and performing the duty that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him to perform when he spoke at the last khutbah. For those of us who cannot afford to buy the Quran, please write to the Islamic Propagation Center, Box 2439, Durban, and just say, I cannot afford to buy the Quran, you'll get your free copy. The tapes, the normal cassettes, will be ready early next week. The video cassettes of the series will be available in plus minus three weeks' time. As you can see, it is being done by professional people. I believe they said there will be a professional trinity on the stage, so that's why they did it. The video cassettes will be 25 rand each. And you can write to the propagation center. Don't understand this business because Mr. Didat also doesn't understand it. He says you write for a tape, for a cassette, you send your 25 rands, they send the cassette to you. You keep it for a month. If you like it, keep it. You feel, well, I've seen enough and I've made 10 copies of it. Send it back, you get your 25 rands back. <laughs> we invite you, please, to come tomorrow evening to the city hall. 
the topic promises to be an interesting one. The crucifixion or the crucifixion. Please be early. The city hall is not that big. Ask the Malay choirs, then I go to the Good Hope Center. On Monday evening at the Athlon Civic Center, the topic will be Al-Quran, a visual miracle. A brief answer was given the other evening. What, what miracles did Muhammad وسلم, perform? In the Quran, we say in the, in the Ahadith, there are tons of examples. Some may question, are the Ahadith uh, valid or are they invalid? We say, well, forget the Ahadith. The Quran is the living miracle and the visual miracle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I don't claim to be able to take over the topic of Brother Ahmad, but all the miracles which Jesus, peace be upon him, performed, and Abi Musa alayhi salatu wa salam performed, the only people who could testify to that were the people who saw it. Here anybody can testify, Muslim or non-Muslim, he can touch it, see it, and he will be convinced. Please come on Monday evening so that you could also learn further how you can prove that Al-Quran is the visual, living, and ever-living miracle of the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On Tuesday evening in the Kensington Civic Center, which will be the farewell lecture, the question is, is Jesus God? We come now to question time. And I think I speak English to a fairly decent degree. I don't think my voice is bad. I said it is question time. Some people misunderstand it. They think it is lecture time. Some people misunderstand it. They think it's debating time. I think Brother Ahmad has shown in his life that if you challenge him to any debate on the topics in which he specializes, he is only too willing and only too welcome and only too ready to come. If you want to have a debate, please hire a hall and give him decent time in which to prepare his topic, then you will have a debate. But now the normal form of, of uh, or the format of a lecture is I say what I like to say or what I think I would like to say. Then you put your question and I'll give you an answer. We don't fight, we then don't argue. When we come for question time, there's a microphone in front here. Please come and put your question. One question at a time. If you have more than one question and there's a queue behind you, please then go to the back of the queue for the second question. It's over now to question time. John puts his question. I can tell you that he has come to love Brother Ahmad Didat so much, he has set up and accepted the private appointment on Sunday morning because we haven't got the time to answer all his questions. He doesn't perhaps put it in a clear manner at all times, but I feel he is interested and he's here. But he is invited uh, on Sunday to come and spend a short time with Brother Ahmad. A question, please, John. Um, Mr. Ahmad Didat. If your wife knows you have a servant there and she is barren, she can't bear. She can't bear a child to you. And she tells you, you can take her as wife. And the God Almighty says that your bare woman that can't bear a child, she will bear a son to you. Which one will you accept? I think what uh, young John has in mind is this, that Sarah, the wife of Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, she couldn't bear any children, no children. So, you know, getting old, Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam is getting old, Sarah is getting old, everybody's talking about she's barren, she's barren, she's barren. It's a disgraceful thing among the Eastern people not having a child. So she says, look, go unto Hagar, Hajra, and be get child by her. Now, this is how weddings took place. 
You know, there were no ceremonies going to court before the magistrate, and then he reads out a formula to you, and then he gives you a certificate. No. My daughter, you see all the prophets when they went, got the wife, he said, look, he said, oh, take her to wife. That means it's yours. And he's his wife. Only man who has a right to her is that person to whom the woman is given. Hajra was supposed to have inherited Sarah is supposed to have been given this Hajra as her maid. And she said, look here, have her. And Hazrat Ibrahim a man of God, a friend of God. Would we say that he was committing adultery with her? If he was, God Almighty would have reprimanded him. No. His friend, Khalilullah, the friend of God, everybody says, the Jew says the father Abraham, the Christians say father Abraham, Muslims say father Abraham. This father of ours committing adultery? Can we ever think like that? Can we ever talk like that? Hmm? So he goes on to her and she begets a child. Now when she begets a child, for 13 years, there was no question about an offer being made. He said, look, do you want through this one or that one? There was no question because the woman is not getting it. Sarah is not getting any children. And for 13 more years, she didn't have anything. 13 years. Hazrat Ismail salam, was the only son and seed of Abraham for 13 years. After 13 years, Allah wants to also bless Sarah. And so he, she also gets a child and his name was Ishaq. So what is the problem? If God Almighty, according to the Bible, he says, and as for Ishmael, Ishmael thy son, and as for Ishmael thy seed, if you believe that this is the word of God, then God is saying, Ishmael your son, if God accepts, who the hell are you? Or any monkey, you know, to take say, no, he's not his son. What right has anybody to come along and deny him that right? If I married a Bushman woman, or a Hottentot woman, and she gave birth to a child, I accept that child as my child. What right have you to say that's not my child? I ask you. Have you any right? So on the standard, the Jewish standard, he said, look, you think that Sarah is the legitimate wife and this is the illegitimate wife? I said, look, even then, your progeny in which Jesus came is a rotten, a rotten progeny than that of Ismail on that standard that you are giving. We are not creating the standards. These are not our standards. These are the standards as we are. You judge, and Jesus told you. He says, judge not, that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, ye shall be measured unto you. He says, you hypocrite. He says, why seest thou the beam in thy brother's eye, and seest not the moat in thy own eye? He says, first remove the moat from thy own eye before wanting to remove from your brother's eye. He says, you must heed that warning. Heed that warning, that before you point a finger, think twice. This man, the Jew, didn't think twice. So he got into a mess. We must think twice before we open our mouth. What you say, how you judge other people. Uh, just before, John, uh, would I be fair if I say that if there's nobody else with a question, we give you another question, opportunity for another question. Is that fair? Is there another person to put a question? Please come to the front. Chairman, yes. Sorry, I've just been asked on my way up if you could later give an explanation where the Kensington Civic Centre is. Yes, it's in, am I correct in saying it's in 12th Avenue? Right down. Uh, who can help me? Kensington Civic Centre, right down 12th Avenue, opposite the police station. 13th Avenue, opposite the police station at the bottom. Oh, they say 13th Avenue is a one-way, you have to go down 14th Avenue, and then you'll have to turn left to get to the police station. Don't go, in, don't go into the wrong one, they may keep you there. Yeah, I don't ask for myself. Oh, I see, thank you. Your question into the microphone, please. Well, I was chatting with Mr. Didat yesterday evening after the meeting, and, um, well, I regretted that uh, the emphasis on question time does exclude exclude rather uh, any corrections now i think if we um, have a meaningful question time then we should also uh, stick 
to certain corrections, if there are any, of course. Yeah. Um, I was quite amazed um, about the statement that Mr. Didat made in speaking about the adulteress that was caught um, when he said the Bible doesn't state uh, what Jesus wrote into the sand, but I can tell you. And then he gave us the combinations of name, Mary and Joseph, um, David and uh, Bathsheba. Now, uh, I can't remember to have that read at any place in the Quran. And I can only um, conclude from that that it must have been made up in his own imagination. Now, I think truth in that respect is very important because it could start off a filthy thinking on these aspects uh, as has been also, well, the tendency, been a tendency yesterday night in certain combinations that I have discovered where I felt very, very sorry. Um, in this point, and there I come to my question, Mr. Didat pointed out that the Jews have the punishment of stoning for adulterers, and so does the Quran say. I would like to um, ask him to read to us from the Quran uh, where it says that adulterers should be stoned. Could you please do that for us? Uh, I, forget, I forget your name. Mr. Walton. <laughs> Mr. Walton, yes. Now, this was not an exposition of what Islam says and what Christianity says. With regards to that adulteress that they brought before Jesus, you see? Now, you haven't got an alternative answer to say, what was Jesus scribbling? You haven't. If you had, you would have given it to the audience and said, look, this is what he was doing. He wasn't doing what did that suggest. So, in, in the absence of a theory that you, the Christian world has been absent, they have not been able to, the only uh, assumption we can have is that for people to watch over his shoulder and walk away, what for? What are they reading? Well, can so, we read, this can was my assumption. Well, it, but it's against the biblical text, you must see. Because what does it say? Well, it states clearly that, that Jesus first wrote into the sand and afterwards he told the people, uh, the, the one who is without sin may throw the first stone. You put the order the other way around and then said when they looked over the shoulders, no, the they question, could see the, that. The problem it doesn't is, say anything like no, that in no, the, the Bible. The problem is, what did he write? That's not my problem, it's you, yours. No, 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 it's yours because you haven't got it. No, now, I don't need it because now, I don't no, no, make you need anything it. up. Now you need it. You see the Bible you are using. What Bible are you using there? I, I use the Bible. No, no, which Bible is it? Well, which Quran do you use? I use Yusuf Ali's. Which one do you use? Well, this is the NIV Bible. Huh? What Bible is it? In this case, it's the NIV Bible, but it doesn't NIV. matter. New N International Version. Right. Uh, I could use the Greek right. New Testament as well. Now I can tell you that in the RSV, hmm. this incident about the adulterers is thrown out as a fabrication. No, sorry, it's in the, it's in the, at the bottom, uh, as I a margin remark. In but the text, me, in Mr. The Didat, could you please answer to my question? Could you please read from the Quran? No, no where that, is, that is not my job. It I, is. I spoke, you the, made subject the, was, the subject was, if you remember, the subject was Arabs and Israel. I spoke for one and a half hour, and you haven't got a single question on the subject. I have a well, subject. Please I, come to that first before we entertain you with other things. Mr. Didat, if you, I put a question to anything you say tonight, then this is according to the subject. Otherwise, you have Look, wandered away from your subject. The subject, the the subject is Arabs and Israel, conflict or conciliation. On that theme, I spoke for one and a half hour. No, and you <laughs> otherwise you couldn't have made that statement. Please, could you please answer my question? Where does it no, say there the is Quran? No, there is no such verse. Well, that About is stories, question. there is no such verse in the Quran. Well, that's, that's what I wanted to know. No, 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 but no, because I believe that truth is important. Now, if you make a statement... Did I say it's in the Quran? Yes, you said. You can listen to it. Did I say video. that stoning is in the Quran? Yes, you said. I think, you see, people come along with preconceived ideas. You see, you hear what, is, what you brought from the outside. The tapes are available. You buy this one tape and you go and listen to it at home and see if I said that the Quran says that the adulterer, I said in the book of Leviticus, it says that the adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to death. Leviticus, and Leviticus is not the Quran. Okay, we can listen to the tape and then right. we meet again. Thank you. Right. 
Thank you. You have no questions on the subject itself. Anybody else with a question on the topic? As I said at the previous night, just hold it, I said at the previous night that the pamphlets were out for some time. Like for Sunday night, for Saturday nights tomorrow, if you have any questions you want to prepare beforehand, then you prepare it on the subject because the lecturer will prepare for that topic. Brothers and sisters, please don't forget our request of coming to the other lectures and please come and purchase the translations of the Quran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good night, ladies and gentlemen.